Okay, hi, uh, my name is Derek, and I'm your instructor for our machine learning course. Um, in this video, we're going to go over uh, two things, but probably relatively quickly, um, kind of uh, an overview of, of using the Scikit-Learn framework for doing machine learning and the STAS model library for doing machine learning. Um, I kind of have this uh, separate uh, video and notebook uh, because um, I wanted to give a little bit of uh, some things about the, uh, especially about the STAS model library for an assignment I'm kind of um, adding into the course here. Okay, so th this week and next, um, this is meant to go along with um, the units where we are looking at using uh, scikit-learn mostly. Um, so one week we kind of use scikit-learn to uh, do a regression problem, and then the week after that we'll look at a classification problem, okay? Uh, after after these, we're going to get into um, the actual details of how these machine learning algorithms work, like um, you know how linear regression works and um, uh, machine learning classifiers work and things like that. Okay, but but these first two weeks is is a little bit more just a, a big you know, big picture kinds of things, trying to just understand the framework, you know, so, so you don't have to understand the algorithms yet and kind of how machine learning works, but you, you can understand uh, scikit-learn um, and um, how to build a model, even though you might not know what the model is doing and, and how to use that to fit some data and make predictions and things, okay? So, so yeah, we'll just go, we'll, we'll just go over, um, some things that there should be a lot of repetition between this and some of the other materials that we had this week. Okay, so this is, this is kind of meant to be an overview or a review of the scikit learn framework, and then you know we'll do a, um, a regression and a classification as an example. Uh, but then also, as I mentioned, I wanted to really quickly show the stats model because I kind of threw that into um, an, our assignment uh, for the class here. So um, I'll talk just a little bit about the STAS model and then show the same linear regression and log logistic regression classification uh, problem uh, using the STAS model library. All right. Um, at the moment, I've got this named 3-4, uh, so we're doing this in Unit 3, uh, but, but you know, it'll be for Unit 3 and Unit 4, so um, um, kind of you can watch it uh, during both of those weeks or both of those units there, okay? Um, so, and yeah, it lives kind of in archive right now, but also I might change that in the future. So, so you might uh, need to read where, um, uh, I've changed it because it's not really archived anymore. So, um, all right. So, so first we'll start with, uh, the stats model or start with the scikit-learn, um, framework. All right. Um, so, like I said, this should be kind of a summary of the stuff that we're doing. So, so using our new uh, textbook, the Argerian Hands-On Machine Learning textbook, um, he uses Scikit-Learn for all the examples and things, right? So, um, so, so it pays if we're using this textbook um, and, and doing things in the class the way we're doing to, to kind of really understand how the framework works um, and kind of what ex its expectations are and things like that, okay? So uh, first of all, um, also some review. It, this isn't necessarily this isn't necessarily specific to scikit-learn. So most all the machine learning um, algorithms or, or frameworks or libraries that we use expect the data to be in this kind of a format, okay? So this is just an, in general our, our format for data, okay? So you can think of it as a table, like, like a database table, uh, where each row is a sample or um, a, a subject, an experiment or something like that, or, you know, might, might be a subject from a poll um, um, if we're doing... Uh, um, polling for politics um, or, or a survey, you know. So, so, so each one represents a subject maybe or, or like a, a, an experimental trial, right? Those are the, called the samples. And then each column is a feature, okay? So in the most generic case, the, these columns can be of different types, you know, so again, like let's, let's say we're doing polling data. So, you know, you could have the, the subject's age and, and their uh, address or their general um, district they live in or something like that and then you could have specific answers to specific questions you know so uh, do you approve or disapprove of the candidate do, you know and so on forth so those are just examples of features right if this was an experimental trial you know this this might be try just the trial number one two three um, and then this might be the measurement of 
carbon dioxide in the experimental reaction after one minute and five minutes or, or things like that. So, so those are just examples of the features, okay? Um, and then, so both regression and classification are examples of supervised learning like we talked about, and, and we'll spend most of our time in this class on supervised learning uh, problem. So machine learning where we're doing supervised learning. So all that means for supervised learning is that for each of our samples, uh, if, if we want to build a model of it, we've got um, a target, a label, right? So, so by convention, we usually call the, the the feature matrix X, and then the target vector or the target labels Y. Okay, um, and some other things. Um, oh, and I actually have this mislabeled. I just noticed, or or the textbook does. So normally we think of it as there are um, N samples. So N is the sample size. Um, and then there's M features, so we use a separate variable, a small n and small m. So I should I need to go back and fix that there. Um, all right. Um, and then so right, if we have n samples, if, if if n is our sample size, number of samples or number of trials in the experiment or whatever, then we're going to have n labels um, in our target vector if we're going to be su doing supervised learning. Okay. So if this is a regression task, the labels are whole numbers, right? So if, if if um, we're trying to, like in this lecture, we're going to be predicting house prices for our regression example again, which we use similar examples, although well, this, this is a different data set this time. But in that case, it's, it's, it's the, what we're trying to predict is a real valued number. So, so we can have, in theory, uh, infinitely precise decimal um, number for, for the house price, although, although in practice, you know, we wouldn't have a price below dollars or dollars and cents at most, right? So um, if this is a classification problem, then the, the labels are going to be um, a discrete value. So at the, the, uh, the simplest case is it's a binary label, true or false, right? Um, uh, this can be more complex, and I, I don't know if I haven't talked about this at least at this point in this class yet. But I mean, so a general classification problem can get you can get more and more classes, and then you, the the boundary between whether it's a regression problem or a classification problem can begin to blur. Okay, so if I have a thousand categories, I mean, you know, I've got lots of labels, but I can still treat it as a classification problem. But if I have a million categories, so the, the only difference though is there are some things that really have to be classification problems because if the labels have no ordering to them, then um, then, then you really can't treat it as a regression problem because there's no relate, there's, there's no idea that, that, you know, label five is similar or close to label six if there's no inherent ordering. So, so the ordering is arbitrary. But if there is an ordering, um, so yeah, so, so if I just think of my house prices as, as whole dollar amounts, I mean, I could treat it as a categorization problem where, you know, the, the house price is category of $50,000 or $50,001 up to the maximum, like a million dollars maybe is, is my maximum, right? So I would have a whole lot of categories in that case, but but um, um, you could make it a categorization problem, okay? Uh, normally, it, it, it's, it's somewhat of a disadvantage to have lots and lots of categories, although sometimes you need to do that. So, so really, in that case, for again, for the price data, there really is a relationship. There's an ordering between $50,000, $50,001, and so on, right? So in that case, if, if you did want to treat it as a categorization problem, you might want to break it up into less categories than that. That would usually that usually works better if you manage the number of categories. So you might want to try and make it a category of fifty thousand to a hundred thousand, and, and like in fifty thousand dollar steps, and then your next category is a hundred thousand to one hundred fifty thousand. All right. So anyway, the the, the to summarize that some categorization problems, um, I'm sorry, some, some regression problems can be changed into categorization problems, right? Um, but, but the reverse isn't always true. So there are some categorization problems, if there's no in inherent ordering in the labels, that you really can't turn into a regression problem, right? So, so if, if you can't arrange your categories in any way, um, you, you can't use methods for regression prediction to do it, okay? All right, so let's move on. Um, that's, that's probably enough about that. Um, so 
the basics of the scikit-learn API that we've been talking about this week and next are, are this, whether you're doing regression or classification. Um, so, so, you know, we have to have the data arranged in this particular way. And for scikit-learn and for most machine learning, the data is going to have to all be numeric, okay? So we can use, we can use like a pandas data frame, but if we have non-numeric data strings or, or even category variables, we have to do something to make certain that they are numeric. And then e and even further for many machine learning um, algorithms, it not, not only has to be numeric, but all of the ranges of the data have to be roughly the same. So if we have, have features or columns of wildly varying different ranges, you know, this varies from zero to one, but this one varies from uh, one million to 10 million or something like that. We have to normalize the data in order for many machine learning algorithms to work correctly. Okay, so we've mentioned that previously. I don't think we do an example of that in this um, uh, notebook here, but but uh, that's another thing. So when you're arranging the data as a feature matrix, it has to be, be all numeric. Um, often you have to normalize it. All right, and then basically we choose the class of the model that we want to use as our estimator. Um, you know, as, as the model we want to create. Okay? And so the main thing of this course is, is we're going to be learning some of the details of, of the different kinds of machine learning models that you can use from a library like scikit-learn. Right? Then we have to choose the model hyperparameter. So one of the reasons why we want to learn about the details of these machine learning algorithms is all of them have different kinds of hyperparameters, things you can tune, right? And, and they sometimes don't make a lot of sense unless you actually study the, the details, the inner workings of some of these things, right? So, so that's one of the, another reason why we, um, you know, after this third and fourth unit, we begin to dive into the details of some of these machine learning um, algorithms. Um, and then for supervised learning, we're going to fit the data to our labels or our targets, right? So fitting the data means that um, we're basically building a model. So we're basically learning what are known as parameters. Um, so, so theta parameters, which is something we'll talk a lot more in detail later on, right? So yeah, for, for supervised learn, learning, we're going to be using that to build a model. I think of that building a model as, as building a function in the mathematical sense. So it's a function that can map the features of a sample um, and, and try to make a prediction on what the label should be. And, and we learn how to do that mapping, how, how to make that function uh, for supervised learning by giving it a set of, of labels to train with our target vector so we can create a mapping from inputs to output. That, that's hopefully good that, that will hopefully be good at predicting uh, for data that we didn't train with. So unseen data will also um, end up mapping well from an input to a, a label that's that's close to being correct. Right. So for unsupervised learning, um, uh, so so for that, after we fit our model, then we use the predict function to to predict on new data that we haven't seen. You know what 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 its output should be. Again, whether it's, whether it's a, re a regression or a um, classification problem, we'll use predict. We'll talk about unsupervised learning for about a third of this course. Um, so for that, we use transform or predict to infer properties of the data. All right. So let's look at a regression problem. So this is going to be similar to some of the examples we've been using, but in a, a, another data set uh, here, again, we're, we're using housing data again. So maybe I should find some different data sets just so we're not too boring. This one, this data set is a little bit more complicated. So um, if you look at it, um, so our, our first examples this um, week of regression and also our first examples when we dive into the details of linear regression, we start with just a single feature. But in, in this case, we're going to be performing a regression uh, where we're trying to predict the house price. So this is our label. So we need to get this out into the Y. At the moment, I've read it into a pandas data frame, right? But we've got multiple features. So not only do we have the size of the house like we used, um, I think we have the size of the house, don't we? Um, but but we have, have other features like the uh, income of the area, the age of the house, the number of rooms. Um, so yeah, I guess maybe I don't have the size and the, the population of the area. Anyway, so but but we can try and, and build a a model that would predict. Um, so oh, this isn't this is only the cat. This is only the um, 
Um, you know, let's look at all the columns in here. So, so these are all the columns here. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so yeah, we don't have size. I just, uh, should go back and re-remember my data set here. So uh, anyway, um, uh, that doesn't matter. So, so we're going to try and build a, a model f from these, right? Um, so at the moment, these are all numerical. We'll just use the numerical. Actually, we're going to throw away the address. So we can maybe do something with the address, but we won't use it in this example. Everything else is numerical data, so we should be able to use that um, uh, to build a regression model. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and I should skip over this. So, you know, the, again, this is we, we talked a little bit about data exploration and data cleaning, right? So this is just some more examples of kind of exploring the data maybe a bit so you understand it, right? So this is kind of a pairwise plot of all the, you know, t of, of all the features that we have in this data set just so we can get a better feel for if any data, if, if any of the, the features are highly correlated, you know, that kind of thing, so... Okay, so let's, um, so like, and, and for data preparation, um, we want to drop out the price because that's the actual the label that we want to use, and we're not going to use the address here, which is a, um, a string variable. So this gives us our table um, of, of, of data, right? And we just left it as a data frame, but that's fine. So nowadays, I think I've mentioned this in some other places, so it used to be that... Um, Scikit-learn could only work with NumPy tables of data, but it can work with data frames now. Um, you know, again, as long as all the columns can be interpreted numerically for the um, for the algorithms. I'm not certain what Scikit-learn does by default if you give it um, a, a column that's a categorical variable or a string variable. Um, e either it ignores it or it'll give you an error. But um, and then the price is going to be the the target label. All right. So, um, in this class, we're going to look at spelling there. Um, linear regression and logistic regression will be the first two machine learning um, algorithms that we'll talk about in detail. Uh, but, you know, you, you don't have to know the details to, to, to fit a linear regression model. So, as the name implies, this is doing a regression. Um, although logistic regression actually does classification, so so the regression doesn't always imply you're doing a regression problem, which is a little bit of a issue. But that's the that's more of that's not really scikit learns fault. That's logistic regression is just called that. So, uh, so but anyway, so you start by choosing the the model that you want to use as your estimator. You know, to that, that you want to use to build your function that relates input samples to the output label, right? So there's lots of different kinds of estimators that we'll talk about in this class besides the linear regressor, um, so support vector machines and, um, and, and decision trees and, and some others. So. so you choose the class model, then you instantiate the model, and this is the part where you choose the hyperparameters. In this example of video, we're not showing setting any hyperparameters, but and, and, you know, to know, to really understand these, you have to study a little bit about the details of how linear regression works. You can use the um, contextual help function, usually, so, so scikit-learn has better documentation than most um, kinds of things. So, um, once we've um, imported our model, so you, so you might have to actually, there we go, so... Um, um, you know, so some of the, um, some of the hyperparameters you can set will, will be, um, um, given to you in the, um, um, the, the help documentation for when, when you instantiate, or is it for the fit? For when you instantiate the model here. So, um, and then the next thing you do is you fit the model, right? So, so all of, of the scikit-learn um, 
fit transformers have these basic sorts of things you can call with them after you instantiate the model with the hyperparameters. So for supervised learning, you always fit the model where you give it your uh, inputs um, as a table. So it has to be a table with the rows. It's expecting um, in this row form for um, scikit-learn. So, so the rows are, the, are your samples or your um, experimental tries and the columns are the features and then Y should just be a vector like we showed uh, which should have the same number of items in it as the number of samples or the number of rows um, in your data. Um, and then you can, once you fit a model, then you can evaluate the model. So. Um, so uh, th this won't make much sense right now, but uh, these are the actual things that were learned by, by training or by fitting the model in scikit-learn. So, so you've got coefficients um, and this intercept parameter that you can display, all right? So in general, all models that we're going to, a lot of the models that we're going to look at in this class um, have a set of, have, have an intercept, this is also known as a bias term. Um, and one or more coefficients. So there should be one coefficient for every feature column, right? So we had like uh, five columns or, or five features in our data set that we trained with, so we actually ended up with five coefficients, and then a sixth one called the, um, the intercept here, which we're displaying, all right? So again, I mentioned those because I asked you to also display those in the second assignment here for the class. Uh, here we, we kind of show what the coefficient ended up being for each one of these five features, right? So, so this is the the fitted parameter of the model um, um, that that uh, basically uh, makes a relationship between the input feature and and how it uses that to predict the output label, which is the um, which is the house price again in our case here. And then we can use that to predict. Okay, so we could predict on our, our on the original data, right? Um, um, so here I'm just showing, we're plotting the predicted price against the actual price, right? So if we were 100% accurate all the time, this would look exactly like a straight line, right? If we were doing really poorly, uh, you wouldn't it, it wouldn't seem to be having any kind of relationship at all. It would just look like a big blob if, if our predicted price had no relationship to the actual price. So we're not doing too bad. Um, so, I mean, there, there's, you, know, you shouldn't expect to get a perfectly fit, a perfect line here. Uh, this, this is different from the, 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 the model fit, okay? So um, I, I don't want to confuse too much, but by, by plotting the actual value to the predicted value, uh, we can see how well, how well, how well we correlated um, how well the correlation is between our predictions and the, the true price here, all right? Um, so as we talk about in um, the, the, the materials for the class this week, um, it's, it's, you really shouldn't use how well you're doing on predicting the data that you trained with or that you fit the model with as, a, as, as as an indication of how well your model performs, right? Um, so, you know, the question isn't how well c can you perform on the data that you train with, because you can always build models that are overpowered and that overfit the data, so they perform very well, if not perfectly, on the data you train with. And, and, and we have a lot more about that coming up in the class, right? So, so we'll, we'll come back to that concept multiple times. So, so the question is, um, so like we like you should have seen in the other materials this week, what you really need to do is see how well it, it work, performs on um, data that you didn't train with. So one way you can do that is use what's known as cross-validation um, training and testing. So for that, what you normally do is you split your data into a testing set and a training set, or sometimes you call it a testing set and a validation set, okay? <coughs> Sorry, a, a, a training set and a validation set, okay? I just called it train and test here, but but this is cross-validation. Um, so you can just split it. So here we split it. We got 3,500 we'll use for training. So we'll only only train with with a, a part of the five the total of 5,000. So we had 5,000 samples or 5,000 rows in this data set, which I forgot to man mention before. So. so if we only fit on that data, then we can predict on um, on, on the data that we didn't fit with, um, and that gives us a better 
idea of, of how well our model is doing. So, so again, you know, this, this, there, there's better ways to evaluate this, and we'll also talk more about things like that. Uh, you know, you know how you, how you make a better determination on, on how well we're doing here, right? So, but you know, again, our our, our uh, correlation between the predictions and the um, the, the true labels, the correct answer on the data that we didn't train with still looks relatively tight um, and, and relatively highly correlated, which is good. So. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about the cost error, like like the mean absolute error, the mean squared error, um, when we talk about linear regression. So that these are better measures of, of how well we're doing. And what you want to have is basically your performance shouldn't become really, can, shouldn't be much worse on the testing data if you look at the these things like the, the squared error or the absolute error um, so the, than it did on the, uh, the the data you trained with. So. And in fact, we not only did no worse, we performed slightly better, which is a, a, an indication that your model did pretty well in generalizing to unseen data here. So. Um, all right. So then let's do another example. So the, the unit four, then we, all, we, we look at so-called uh, classification problems, okay? So logistic regression can be used for classification. It's a little bit misnamed because uh, it has regression in the name. Uh, but but log logistic regression is actually uh, more commonly used for classification problems, okay? Um, so as I already, you know, have discussed, classification is when you, uh, the, the, the thing you're trying to predict is a discrete category okay and so the, the the simplest classification is a binary classifier true or false we're going to use something slightly more difficult we're going to use the MNIST uh, digits uh, database here um, which you will learn more about when we talk about logistic regression so here the data are images which I think I display a little bit of so these are blown up they're only like 24 pixels by 24 pixels um, So, um, so the the normal MNIST database is 24 pixels by 24 pixels. Um, the, this one is a reduced version that we're showing just for example. So I guess yeah, it's only eight by eight pixels. So so it's going to be highly pixel. But but these are supposed to be like handwritten digits: zero, one, two, three. Okay. So anyway, I mean these are good examples of classes. So we want to build a classifier using a logistic regression ob object. Um, to, you know, given the, the, the 64 pixels in this case as input, predict that it's a, it's a zero, or, or, or these 64 pix pixels predict it's a one, okay? So, um, um, what we'll do, instead of training with the whole data like we did before, we'll just right away do a, a, a train test split so we can validate our performance on data that we haven't seen before. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, after that, I mean, all these steps are going to be the same as what we just did for a regression problem, um, even though it's, it's the, the, the Y labels here um, are discrete categories, 0 through 9, I think, or is it just 0 through 5? Yeah, so I guess, yeah, we've only got, we've only got examples in this, this small example database of, of the first five categories, so 0, 1, 2, 3s, and 4s. So we've only got five categories total uh, in this example. Um, but, but yeah, so, you create, so here we've got um, um, some more interesting examples of some metaparameters. So you can specify the uh, solver. So this has to do with which optimization method you're using um, to try and fit your model when, when we come to fitting it. Um, we can specify things like um, the, the C parameter here or the penalty. Uh, which uh, we use, a, which I, I mentioned a little bit in our second assignment. So this has to do with what's known as regularization, um, which is a, a, a penalty that you apply in order to try and make your models generalize better, um, w especially when you're doing, well, it, it works both for regression and classification. But um, um, And then C is kind of um, um, a parameter you can use to 
tune the amount of importance you give to fitting the model and regularizing the model and, and, and so on. Yeah, all the stuff we talk about in detail later on. But, um, but yeah, I just wanted to point it out because we do talk a little bit about it in the second assignment here. So, um, but, but yeah, anyway, so you fit the model um, and, and then you have the same kind of things of the coefficients, although here we actually have 64 features, so if you look at the coefficients, there's going to be actually 64 um, coefficients that you get. Um, if, if you put it, oh, and, and um, actually, um, the, as we'll talk about when we talk about logistic regression, we have to build actually five separate models. So there's actually five separate um, categor categorizers being built here. So we have 64 parameters uh, for the first model that, that tries to predict zeros. And then the way these are combined is that you look at the output and you pick the one that had the, the high, that was the most confident in its prediction. And that, that's how you pick the, the actual thing if you want to make a final prediction of whether you think it's a zero, one, two, three, or four. So. Um, so actually uh, uh, evaluating the performance of a Classification problem is slightly different from a regression problem, um, so it makes more sense to talk about the accuracy. So you can you can um, exactly figure out you know what, was I correct or not on the label here. Whereas for a, a regression, a real valued output, I mean there's you're not exactly correct. Uh, the the output can be have an infinite precision, so you can never be perfectly precise. So so your your evaluation for a regression problem is, you know, how how far away am, am I my, my prediction is in terms of the magnitude from the error. So um, so anyway, yeah, so so we get perfect prediction accuracy on the data that we trained with, but we still get like ninety seven percent accuracy um, on the, the data that we haven't seen before, our test data. So. Um, another thing we'll talk about is the confusion matrix. So you can plot this. So basically, the diagonal is saying that um, for the zeros, um, so um, so, sorry, I'm, I'm confusing myself. So, so yeah, now, now it looks like we've got nine. We've got ten categories, so zero through nine. So I have to go back. I'm not, I can't remember which one it is, whether it was four or uh, nine categories here. So uh, maybe the whole set had had all nine categories. Maybe I said wrong uh, before when I uh, when I said this. Oh yeah, it does have all four. I, I only just showed the first five there, so sorry about that. So, so I was mistaken. So it really does have all um, nine digits here. So, so yeah, that, that, that's why the confusion matrix shows, sorry, all ten digits. So that's why the confusion matrix has ten rows by ten columns. So this is the accuracy on zeros um, for our test data. So there was 43 zeros and we got all 43 of them, of them correct. Uh, so we'll, we only missed a few uh, here at that time. So, um, all right. So let's then. Uh, so I'm going to real quickly go through Stats Model Library as well, because, like I said, not because we'll use Stats Model a lot, um, but um, um, I did. Ha I did decide to have you go ahead and use it on the second programming assignment. So this might be the only place you see it before you have to work with it on the the, uh, the second assignment here. So, I mean, there are other models that you can do uh, these same sorts of machine learning uh, things. So, but so stats model, um, the purpose of this library, it's not really for building machine learning predictors or classifiers. It's for doing statistical analysis. Okay, so this is more like something. Uh, so, so other things that aren't in Python that do the same kind of thing. So, I mean, the whole R language is really for statistical analysis. That, that's kind of what it's geared to, uh, as opposed to doing ma building machine learning models for uh, 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 predicting things, right? So by that, so, 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 so the emphasis is slightly different. So, so other statistical analysis packages that are popular are SPSS um, or um, JSP, which I haven't used. Um, so, 
uh, so, so normally if you're a stat statistician and you're trying to make a report, uh, you might want to be doing other kinds of things rather than, than building a machine learning model that you might put into a syst uh, like an online system um, to do something like predict customer preferences so you can try and sell them more things. So in this case, uh, a statistician you know, needs to get certain information about the data, uh, about the fit of the data or other things um, um, to determine statistical properties. Okay? But, you know, things like stats model um, library um, has a lot, a lot of overlap. So, so you can perform linear and logistic regressions as well as some other things uh, in there that, that are done commonly to do um, statistical analysis with. So um, if you want to import the stats model library, this is what... The, the common convention is we port it as SM, but there's actually a, a, a defined API, so you want to you want to import the API sublibrary. Um, so we can do the same. We can perform the same um, linear regression and the same logistic regression on the data using Stats Model. Um, there are some differences. So one difference is is that um, um, site Scikit-Learn will automatically add in uh, what's known as a dummy or an intercept feature. Um, so the, 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 the matrix of um, your feature matrix that you pass into Scikit-Learn, you don't have to do anything to it, right? But, um, and, and you'll understand more about this, why this, this has to do with that bias term that, that I uh, mentioned briefly, that um, it's fit when you do a linear or a logistic regression, right? But stats model doesn't do that for you by default. So before you can fit a stats model um, to a set of data, you, um, uh, if it doesn't already have the bias term in there, you have to add it. Uh, but there's a function in the stats model API that does that for you. You can just say add constant, and it will do what needs to be done to add that in there. Right? Um, so if, if you look at x um, before, so x... Um, our array x, when we first created it, um, had after we after we dropped the things had just these one two three, you know these five columns right one for each of the features. So basically, if if you look at x after you um, add the constant features. Um, um, it's going to now be um, Um, sorry, I accidentally deleted that, uh, didn't I? Um, just a second, let me pause for a second so I can gotta bring that cell back. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, sorry to confuse myself, I accidentally deleted that. So, um, as I was saying, after you add that column in there, um, add that constant, you'll, you'll find that it's added a new dummy column in here. So, uh, and this will make more sense um, uh, why we do this um, later on when we, t when we look at linear regression, logistic regression, the details of it. So, but if you look at x.shape, um, it's now 5,000 by 6, and if you look at, um, let's say, the first five rows of it, um, uh, you'll see it's got that constant, everything's one there, okay? So, I mean, you can do that by hand, but it's got that nice function to do it for you. So anyway, back, back to um, SAS model. Um, so, the linear regression, um, I mean, Again, this is one of the, the things about doing machine learning is, is that uh, these concepts, I, I wouldn't say that they've been reinvented in lots of places, but um, um, the, the, the same ideas um, are used 
in kind of different ways and have their own different set of um, of uh, jargon and, and things and, and usage by the practitioners in different kind of areas, right? So anyway, uh, another kind of name for linear regression is ordinary least squared model. So, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the what's known as the cost function where we use a... a, a a squared error, a least squared error a model. So anyway, um, um, so if you want to do a, a linear regression, you have to use OLS, which which is an acronym for the ordinary least squared. But and 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 you have to fit the, the data. So so here, um, um, if you want to specify metaparameters. Um, uh, you do you can do this here as well, I believe. Although you know, normally, uh, you know, unlike for machine learning, um, um, you don't do that as much when you're doing a statistical analysis. But but um, and another difference you should notice here is that um, um, for whatever reason, the the STAS model uh, changes the order of these, so it thinks of y as a function of x. Or so, so anyway, you have to pass in the the, the labels, um, which are regressor labels in this case, um, which it calls the indog, um, the, the response variable. So again, so notice there's all kinds of nomenclature for this. So that, that's really the dependent variable, the, the label you're trying to predict. Um, and the, the, the other one is the exogenous variable, which is, our, which is the independent um, um, variable. Um, anyway, but, but if you if you can get the APA right, you know you're you're you're, you're um, conceptually doing the same thing here. And in fact, you're not conceptually; you are actually doing the the exact same linear regression fit, as we'll see here. Um, um, so oh, the, well, another difference from the API. So for scikit-learn, you you give the x and the y when you do the fit. Here you actually give it when you're instantiating the object and the metaparameters, and then and then you call fit separately to perform the model fitting. All right. Um, So you should compare those. Um, I th you should get exactly the same parameters um, um, if you look at the coefficients. Although again, you know you, you get the parameters. This is how you you find the model parameters that were fit. So you use the dot params for um, stats model, right? Um, oh, and and though it does um, kind of nicely for you, it keeps it as like a, a it's, it's doing something like pandas data frame uh, still here. So so it still has the the labels for each one of these. Uh, including also for the constant, that, that constant parameter. So, but, but if you go back up and compare those to the fit that we had uh, when we did the linear regression the first time, um, you should functionally get the same ones, including this is the, uh, the, the constant coefficient, and then these are the other ones. So average area income was 25.578 um, and, and so on. Right, so so there, that's twenty one point five seven eight in scientific notation. So times ten to the one. So, so and hopefully all those are the same. Um, but here is kind of the, the the main thing for stats library is is normally what a statistician wants is this summary. Okay, so uh, this tells us a lot of stuff about the fit. Um, so I just wanted to point out a few things because I, I also talk about these a little bit on the assignment two. So here's the R squared. Um, so you need to use the score um, function for scikit-learn if you want to find out what the R squared parameter, this, this is a measure of how good the fit was between the, the data um, and the, um, the uh, dependent variable y. Right. So the best you can do is R squared of one, right? And 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 so a high value point nine like this means that you probably have a pretty good fit. Another indication of fit. So so notice for every one of these parameters, we've got the coefficient again. So so these are the same fitted values of the, of the coefficient that, that we printed out by accessing the the params from here, and the same one that we had. And they sh they should be the same values again that scikit-learn fitted for our regression problem here. 
Um, but but these are, are very useful to a statistician over here. This column, so this represents the 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 ninety five percent confidence interval. So this is telling us that this this was the best fit parameter, but we're also ninety five percent confident that this parameter is somewhere between. Um, uh, it's a little bit tough to see in scientific no notation. So uh, let's look at this one. So the average area income parameter, our best fit um, was at 21.57. We're 95% confident, though, that the true value of this parameter sh needs to be somewhere between 21.31 and 21.84, given this data. Okay, And how can you be 95% confident that the true value for this parameter is between that? Um, you know, you have to know a little bit about statistics uh, to know how you calculate confidence intervals like that, right? So, um, and there's other things you could figure that, that are interesting to a statistician about this that we won't, that are kind of beyond the scope of this course. But, um, but, but yeah, using stats models, it's the summary that, that mostly people want to know about, kind of the fit of their model to the, the data here. So. Um, all right, and then kind of just to finish up, let's show the logistic regression. So I won't, I won't give as much comment on this, but again, um, um, we can use the same data that we used for scikit-learn. Um, we can even import the data from scikit-learn, uh, but then train a stats model. So here, the the model is called MN Logit, which again, um, Logit um, is. A reference to the func to the cost function that's used for logistic regression, right? So anyway, um, and again, oh, and, and again, this time we we actually split into train and test sets before we do our model fit, like we did uh, for Scikit-Learn, uh, but also the API. You know, you, you give y first followed by x, um, and you give that when you instantiate the object, um, and then when you fit is where you give the meta parameters for stats model. So, right, if you want to specify a different optimization method, um, and I assume you have similar kinds of parameters that you can do that, that scikit-learn exposes here. So, like, uh, maybe you can add regularization and other things. Um, so, anyway. In this case, um, uh, the, the model didn't quite converge well using this solver, um, and I'm not going to go into why, but, but it does mean that um, um, if, if you get an error on the convergence, you can't really use the summary function here. All right. So um, I think you can find some optimizers that will converge. Um, Including, I think that the default that Scikit Learn is probably the LB FGS. So let me just try one here and see how that works. Oh. Yeah, it didn't, didn't do it either. So, anyway, um, but you'll find that even if it didn't converge, um, I think I use that because you end up with pretty similar parameters to the to the scikit learn parameters if you look at them in detail uh, using this one. So, so even though you don't get convergence, so you can't really get a complete summary, um, you can still use this model to predict. Um, Um, and and try it out on your training data and your test data. Okay. Um, all right. So the 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 the, re, the logistic regression classification problem you have to do for your assignment um, actually performs actually is a little bit more well behaved. So it'll converge for you. So you'll be able to to not only you know do this but actually also look at the summary and and compare the parameters better between the fit you get with stats model and the fit that you get with um, scikit-learn all right 
Um, all right, so you know, um, I hope that 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 was kind of a useful summary of the scikit learn, and I hope that you know, like I said, um, it, it's mostly just so that that you have one place at least to see some of the things that, that I ask you to do on the second assignment with stats model, okay? But but I mostly add in stats model just so you can kind of get a comparison and, and see that, you, that you, know, you can do the same kinds of things in different libraries. Um, so, so you also have ways to do some of the statistical stuff in um, SciPy, has some a, a stats package. I'm sure there's other um, um, specialized functions in Python to do these things. Okay, so that's it for this video. Um, I hope that that was useful, and I will see you guys all in the next one.